What about the Gibbs free energy? It can also be used to determine if a process is spontaneous. Consider again a process A plus B that is in equilibrium with C plus D. We can calculate the change in enthalpy and entropy of a process at a given temperature to find the change in Gibbs free energy. This will tell us the change in the total entropy of the process times the negative temperature. Similar to the Helmholtz free energy, this is very useful because the terms used to find delta G are all based on the system. The plot on the bottom left illustrates both entropy and Gibbs free energy as a function of reaction coordinate, and you can see that they are mirror images of each other. As one increases, the other decreases. This is from the negative sign in the relationship between them. So processes with positive entropy changes are spontaneous. This means that they must have negative changes in the Gibbs free energy to be spontaneous. If the change in Gibbs free energy is equal to zero, then the system is at equilibrium. And finally, if changes in Gibbs free energy is greater than zero, then the reverse process is spontaneous. The change in Gibbs free energy also quantifies the non-expansion work possible by a process. To show this relationship between delta G and non-expansion work, we will assume that the process is reversible. At constant temperature, dG is equal to dH plus TdS. Additionally, assuming constant pressure, we can use the definition of enthalpy being dH is equal to dU plus PdV to get dG is equal to dU plus PdV minus TdS. Then, using the first law of thermodynamics, we get dg is equal to dw plus dq plus pdv minus dq, where we can now cancel out like terms. Assuming that there is both expansion and non-expansion type work, denoted as negative pdv and dw no expansion, meaning that is the portion of the work that is non-expansion type work, we can cancel out the pdv terms and be left with dg is equal to infinitesimally small amounts of non-expansion type work. And since this relationship holds for each infinitesimal step, then we can state that delta G is equal to the non-expansion work. Non-expansion work is any work that doesn't involve an expansion. Examples include electrical work in an electrochemical or biological cell, or other kinds of mechanical work such as winding of a spring or contraction of a muscle. The predominant example used in this course will be electrochemical work. On the right is a diagram of a fuel cell, which is one example of an electrochemical process. The hydrogen-rich fuel reacts at the anode to form protons and electrons. The electrons move through the circuit while the protons move through an electrolyte, where they both react with oxygen to form water at the cathode. The change in Gibbs free energy can be used to determine the amount of energy that can be used to do work from a cell such as this, since work must be done to push the electrons through the circuit. Let's do an example now where we're going to calculate the non-expansion work done by a fuel cell. So in this case, in a fuel cell, we can use natural gases such as methane, and it basically does the same redox reaction as a combustion process to produce carbon dioxide and water. And what it does is it generates electricity. And so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the maximum electrical work can, that can be obtained from one mole of methane at 25 degrees Celsius. So the first thing we should do is we should just write down what the reaction is. So in this case, it's a combustion reaction, as the problem states. And so we've got our methane, which is a gas, plus 2 times O2, which is also a gas. And that's going to then produce CO2, which is a gas, plus 2 times water. And that, in this case, is going to be a liquid. And we make sure that this is balanced. We have one carbon and one carbon. We have four oxygens, and we have two oxygens plus two oxygens, and then we have four hydrogens, and we have two times two, so we have four hydrogens. To calculate the change in Gibbs free energy, then we're just going to go back to its definition, where we've got delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And so in this case, what we'll do is we'll calculate for this reaction, which is the system in this case, we'll calculate the change in the enthalpy, and we'll calculate the change in the entropy. So, starting with the change in the enthalpy of the reaction, delta RH is going to be the weighted sum of the heats of formation of the products minus the weighted sum of the heats of formation of the reactants. And so looking up these values in a table, what we find is that for the products, we have for the carbon dioxide, it's minus 393.509. 
And with that, we're going to add 2 times the heat of formation of water, which is negative 285.8. And from that, we're going to subtract off minus 74.9, and that's the heat of formation for the methane. And to that, we're going to add 2 times 0, because the standard heat of formation of oxygen is going to be 0. We evaluate these two terms, we get minus 965.109, and to that we're going to add 74.9, and so in the end our delta H for the reaction is negative 890.2 kilojoules per mole. Let's now calculate the change in entropy for the reaction. And we can follow the exact same template, it's a weighted sum of the standard enthalpies of the products minus the weighted sum of the standard enthalpies of the reactants. And so in this case, for the carbon dioxide, the standard enthalpy of formation is 213.6. To that I'm going to add the entropy for the water, which is 2 times 69.9. From that I'm going to subtract off 186.2 which is the entropy of the methane, and to that I'm going to add 2 times 205.0. And remember, again, enthalpies for standard states do have values because, again, the zero value for entropies is at 0 Kelvin, and since we're at 25 Kelvin, then there is certainly an entropy for oxygen. I'm going to sum these two individual terms, 353.4 minus 596.2, which gives me an entropy of negative 242.8 joules per Kelvin per mole. And I just want to point out that these values that I substituted in, these are in joules per Kelvin per mole, whereas the values that are substituted in here for enthalpy, these are in kilojoules per mole. This is an important thing to note because now when we calculate our change in Gibbs free energy, we have to make sure that our enthalpy and our entropy are in similar terms so that we're actually adding apples to apples. And so all that means is that I'm going to use kilojoules per mole as my reference for my energy. So I can directly write in negative 890.2. To that I'm going to be subtracting off the temperature, which is 25 plus 273.15 to, tra to translate the 25 degrees Celsius into Kelvin. And then here for my entropy term, I'm going to write negative 242.8 times 10 to the minus 3 so that I can convert it into kilojoules. When I do that evaluation, what I get is negative 817.8 kilojoules per mole. Now, since the question was asking us for what is the work for one mole of methane, this number is in kilojoules per mole. So if I were to take negative 817.8 kilojoules per mole, and multiply it by one mole, since I have one mole of methane, then that gives me negative 817.8. And so that's the total non-expansion work that can be extracted from this fuel cell reaction. Now there are two points that I want to also elaborate on here. The first of which that you'll notice is that our change in entropy is less than zero. And so what that means is that the work that can be extracted is less than the heat that's actually output, and the heat that we can see output is up here with the enthalpy. And basically what that means is that we lost some of the work that was possible through this reaction because we gained more order, and that was expressed here by our lowering of the entropy. The second point that I wanted to make here is that if this were a heat engine, then what that would mean is that the efficiency would be governed by 1 minus T cold over T hot. But in this case, what that would mean is that we would actually have no efficiency since the process is um, happening at 25 degrees Celsius. And that in reality, because this is an electrochemical cell, we actually get to extract the total amount of work that's calculated based on this electrochemical reaction as predicted by the Gibbs free energy. As for enthalpy, we cannot easily measure the absolute value of Gibbs free energies. 
we assign a value of zero to the standard molar Gibbs free energy of formation of an element in its most stable allotropic form at one bar and 298 Kelvin. We, call it, we can calculate standard molar Gibbs free energy of formation for each compound by determining the standard molar enthalpy of formation minus the temperature times the standard molar entropy. If the standard molar Gibbs free energy of formation is known for each component, for instance, they can be found from a table, then the change in standard molar Gibbs free energy for the reaction is equal to the weighted sum of the standard molar Gibbs free energies of formation of the products minus the weighted sum of the standard molar Gibbs free energy of formation for the reactants.